Uh, so we'll go ahead and start. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, basically what CE does, what NX log does as a whole, and what EE does that's better. Uh, and then talking about migrating from CE to EE. All right. So first step, community edition. Uh, inside of the NX log community edition, obviously this is our entry level product. It's the open source community edition. Uh, this is community supported, uh, community run. Uh, basically it does all the basics. Uh, it does all of the, uh, you know, all the, the, the little things that you need. Uh, so part of what NXLog does, uh, or NXLog CE does in general, is uh, manage events. So it takes inputs, sends them to outputs. And as far as NXLog is concerned, the event flow is an input, an output, and a route. Uh, I think some most of you guys are going to be pretty familiar with this, but just for any that's not, we'll touch this really quickly. Um, routes can also have processors. Um, the idea of a processor is it uh, uh, kind of sits in the middle. Uh, it'll do some kind of performance, uh, or sorry, some kind of formatting change, some kind of buffering, just something that uh, involves the flow. Uh, and then the fourth type of modules we have are extensions. Uh, extensions are used to modify existing modules, so inputs, outputs. Uh, these are, say, if you wanted to add syslog headers to an event, or you wanted to uh, parse an event, uh, you know, that can all be done with the extensions. Um, when we talk about events, uh, we have an event record, which is the raw event. So uh, inside of our product, it's noted, noted as a raw underscore event. Uh, and then from there, we can take the raw event and cut it up to different pieces. Uh, we call those fields. Uh, so for instance, a syslog event can be cut up with the XM syslog modules parse syslog function. And it can create the, the different fields that you're familiar with for syslog. So the times, the severities, the message, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, NXLog has some automatic parsing. Uh, so in the case of, say, Windows event log, we use the IMMS Vista log module, and it will create fields for you automatically. Uh, so basically all the, the uh, fields at the bottom of the event log when you're looking at it, and some of the fields in the inside, they all become their own addressable fields. Uh, fields are important because you can filter based on fields, you can make decisions based on fields, and it's a good way to get rid of any kind of messages or any kind of uh, data in your message that you don't need. Uh, and then there's a way to manually parse the fields. Uh, so you could use something like regex to cut up a event, uh, name it whatever fields you want, uh, modify those fields, and this is good for normalizing, uh, getting that data where you need it to be. Uh, NXLog can be run either agent-based or agentless. Uh, agent-based, it's installed, uh, can access all of the, the local uh, logging. Uh, and then agentless is obviously not installed on the box, but pulling remotely. Uh, a good example of this is acting as a syslog server. Uh, it's kind of important to note that uh, there's a lot of terms floating around that different companies use, uh, collectors, forwarders, aggregators. Uh, some products, they make individual tools for each of these actions. Uh, as far as NXLog is concerned, it's just one product, the NXLog uh, CE or EE product. And then its function is defined by how you configure it. Uh, so all in one tool. Uh, and then an example of a config. Obviously, this is a relatively useless config, but it's good for noting the different parts of the, uh, the configuration file. So we've got global section, where in this is a uh, from a Linux box setting the user and group that NXLog is going to run as. We've got an input module, which is named in. That's the uh, purple text. Uh, it's module instance name. And then the module type is I am null. Uh, obviously, this doesn't do anything. This is good for troubleshooting, though. And then the output module is named out and om null. Uh, the naming scheme is I for input, O for output, P for processor, X for extension. Try to keep it pretty easy. Uh, and then, like I said, routes are the last parts of the event flow. Uh, input to an output is a route. Uh, routes can be prioritized. You can have a many-to-one or one-to-many relationship here. So you can send one in to many outs or however you need. And you can have multiple outs in a configure, or excuse me, multiple routes in a configuration as well. All right, so let's talk about a little bit of the basics. Uh, so we've got different protocols, formats, transports here. Uh, so a couple of the uh, high-end 
Uh, and actually, let me take a step back. We're, this is not going to be an exhaustive list for either CE or for EE. Uh, we're just going to touch on some of the higher level, kind of more uh, popular popular uh, modules. So for CE, JSON, obviously that's huge. Uh, a lot of people are using JSON these days. Uh, it makes parsing events a lot easier. Uh, so instead of having to keep up with a certain, like a syslog style and then parse it out and then get a different style for DNS logs coming in from Windows, uh, you can just shove everything into JSON and let your JSON parsers on the sim handle things. Uh, it's a little bit more flexible in the end uh, and it's a lot easier to work with in my opinion. Uh, we can also ingest uh, CSV, uh, pretty common. Uh, even Microsoft still uses CSV files, uh, IIS for instance. Uh, syslog, very popular as well. Uh, syslog being the format and a little bit of the transport as well. Uh, we can handle multi-line events relatively easily. Uh, XML is also available in the CE edition. Uh, sources and destinations, obviously Windows event log is a big one. Pretty much everyone has some kind of event log uh, ingestion. Uh, so we handle that pretty easily with the MS Vista log module. You know, we've got gray log support. So gray log outputs, gray log ingestion, uh, DBI in and out. Uh, we can read kernel logs. We can use UDS, uh, Unix domain sockets, and then the files. Uh, obviously, again, not exhaustive. Uh, for protocols, some of the popular ones are TCP, UDP, SSL. Uh, CE also has uh, HTTP out. So if you need to send to an HTTP provider, uh, we can do that relatively easily. Uh, some of the features that we have built into the core product is a heartbeat. Uh, so the IM mark module can be used to make sure agents are online, make sure they're still sending their data. Uh, we've got flow control, which is kind of a fun in-depth feature. Um, Flow control is a buffering of sorts, but with a little bit of intelligence to it. Uh, the way flow control works is each module has its own log queue. And the log queue is a place where we can store events. Uh, so if we had a file input to a TCP output, uh, the input module would read the file, stick an event, which an uh, event in the form of a file is just a single line, uh, stick that onto the input, or sorry, the output module's input log queue. Uh, kind of complicated, but as soon as that adds up, um, it's sent. Uh, if the TCP connection is broken for some reason, then it won't send those events, and that log queue will start filling. Uh, if the log queue gets filled, the input module will notice that, and then pause the collection. Uh, we keep up with the position for files, so we know where we left off, and we'll pick back up as soon as the TCP connection is established again. Uh, it'll start sending events from its log queue, and then the input will start placing events into the log queue again. So pretty good, works in most cases really well. Uh, for the case where we can't do flow control, uh, so in case of like maybe a UDP ingestion, uh, buffers work really well there. Uh, so buffers, we have either disk or memory-based buffers. Uh, we also have the option of event correlation on the edges, edges being the hosts or wherever it makes sense, honestly. Uh, and this is, mostly useful for maybe smaller companies or where you want to correlate things on the edge and don't want your SIM to really worry about it. So you want the data to already be there by the time it hits the SIM, uh, we can handle that. Um, the NX log language is there as well. Uh, so we use a Apache style configuration uh, with a little bit of Perl for some of the other, uh, so like the ifs for instance, is more Perl syntax. Uh, the NX log language could be used to filter to normalize, to clean up events, to truncate messages. Uh, it's very flexible. Uh, and then we've got a tool called the NX log processor. Uh, this is really neat. This is a uh, where the NX log service itself is meant to be run as a service. The NX log processor is kind of a one-time deal. Uh, it runs and then it exits. So it's good for some forensics or if you're wanting to get a single file and not really run the service, the processor is great for that. Uh, use the same configuration syntax as the NX log. So uh, it's, it's really just a copy and paste if you need. Uh, and then we've got the exec module. Uh, exec is kind of fun. On each system that we support, it basically just talks to the command line and runs commands as if you were on the command line. Uh, this can be good with working with the NX log language for maybe filtering out warning events and then sending a, a message or triggering a alert 
uh, based on whatever criteria you've set. Uh, obviously, that's a little vague and generalized, but that's that's kind of how we keep the language. It's it's very flexible and can meet just about any kind of need there. Uh, kind of the, one of the strengths of NX log is connecting to many disparate systems. Uh, so connecting a input to an output where they don't really know how to talk the same language, uh, we can jump in there and modify events as needed, uh, send to different protocols. You know, uh, kind of the sky is the limit there. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into EE. All right, so one of the big things we run into is making sure that we're sending messages correctly and that they're getting to the destinations or that we're pulling the events properly. So to that end, we have a few troubleshooting tools that we add with all of our products, so even CE. Uh, so the first thing is we can send a uh, kill signal, a, a SIG user one, uh, which will basically dump the running information, uh, if modules are open, if they're running, what kind of EPS we're seeing. Uh, SIG user two drops it into debug mode. So if there's something that we need to look at, we can enable debug logging without too much effort. Uh, the nxlog.log .log file is listed here as a troubleshooting tool as well, because we feel that we would do a pretty good job of listing problems inside of the log file in a human readable way. Um, we try to do what we can there. Obviously, sometimes it doesn't work out so well, and we're still working on it. But uh, for the most part, we think that the logs are relatively easy to read. And since they are pretty easy to read, we like to use it to help troubleshoot, uh, both by reading events from the NXLog surface itself, as well as using like the log info uh, command that's right below it. It's a function where you can send data to the nxlog.log file. And I'll show an example of that in a second. Uh, and then another way is the file write procedure it comes from the XM file op direct, uh, module. And basically, it's the same thing as log info, but you tell it a file. Uh, the uh, IM, OM, PM null modules can be used for troubleshooting as well. Uh, so if you're not sure that your, say, your input files are reading directly and you don't want to send it to a TCP out, you can always set up an OM null and use something like the log info to spit out the raw event. That way, you can view the, in, the events as they come through without having to worry about sending garbage to TCP connection. Um, coming up with new configurations is sometimes challenging. Uh, so CE handles that, uh, and EE as well, with the ability to choose configuration and then run tests on it. So we've got a couple commands here. Uh, nxlog-c, C lets you choose a configuration file. So if you want to uh, create a new file and test it out before putting it live, you could run a dash C, point to the file, dash V, and you'll check your syntax for the file. And then another fun thing I like to do is, uh, especially when I'm coming up with initial configs, I will stop the service, run a configuration file, and then with a dash F from the command line. And this runs nxlog in the foreground. Uh, one of the big benefits is obviously it started on and stopped easier than going to say services in, in Windows and stopping and starting it. Uh, but a secondary benefit is all of the standard out and standard error is seen on the screen. So if you've got some log info, uh, uh, little blurbs in there, spitting out your events before and after processing, for instance, it'll show up on the screen in real time. Uh, and then about those events. So we have the ability inside of NXLog to do the log info. Uh, this is actually part of the manual, but it's a really neat section. Uh, and I add it to a lot of my configs. Uh, basically, what this does for us, the last exec here, is it'll parse the file for BSD headers. Uh, syslog bsd headers and then it will spit out the entire event uh, the raw event field on the command line and then the next step it does is uh, creates everything uh, the, the existing fields into a json object and prints that out so this does two things it shows you the raw event as it is or as it will be shipped out and then shows you all of the fields that are used currently in that event which is really wonderful for figuring out where things are coming in and where things are being added. All right, so obviously we love CE. CE is a great product and hits the marks for, for most basic scenarios. Uh, a lot of times we need to get more though. Uh, so that's where Enterprise comes in. Uh, Enterprise has all the features of CE plus some. 
Uh, so we'll get into that now. Uh, one of the big changes in EE versus CE is APIs. Uh, CE doesn't have any kind of management infrastructure, uh, and there's no really good way to configure it other than just editing a file and moving on. Uh, so as far as agents are concerned, we have the agent management API. It's brought in by the XM admin and XM SOAP admin modules. Uh, these things, uh, we've got some config, or sorry, we've got some example scripts for, and I'll show that to you later as well. Uh, but this gives us access to information from the agents, uh, EPS, seeing a basic configuration for the hosts, host name, those kind of fun stuff. Uh, as well as the ability to send files. So if we want to send a configuration remotely, we can handle that. Uh, if we want to pull a file, like the log file remotely, we can also handle that. Uh, one of the bigger things that this allows is allows connecting to one of our other, other products. Uh, one of our other products is NXLog Manager. And its whole purpose is to monitor the agent's health, so your NXLog infrastructure, as well as managing the NXLog configurations for your, your, uh, your networks. Uh, configurations being either a direct config configuration attached to a host, or more popularly, a template that's going to be applied to several. Uh, so in most cases, users will want to have one configuration that's pushed out to hundreds of clients. And instead of creating those individually, you just create the template and then assign them to each of the uh, hosts that you want. In the future, when you make changes to that template, uh, then you can push out all of the changes at the same time. Uh, this also grants access to uh, some more public APIs. And uh, coming up in the Manager 6.0 release, that will include uh, automated deployment methods where we can send uh, configurations, send certificates to agents. Uh, another benefit that's a little less visible is helping out with split administrations. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of companies, specifically medium and larger size companies, will split admin roles. So you'll have like an application admin or system admin, or at some point, some team that doesn't have uh, file system level access to a box. Uh, and that can make troubleshooting uh, products in general a little bit more complicated. Uh, in NXLog system, uh, this has helped a bit because the API will send that log file from the agent to the manager. So you can view that in real time without having to log into the, the host itself. Uh, some additional monitoring that comes in for the Enterprise Edition uh, is the FIM module, so file integrity monitoring. Uh, it does exactly what you'd expect. It's uh, what was changed and you know when. Uh, Regmon, same thing. Uh, for Windows boxes, this is for the registry. Uh, we've got a pretty new module called PCAP. Uh, we touched on it a little bit, but it's uh, really awesome. Uh, it basically does what uh, TCP dump, Wireshark, uh, those do. It uses the libpcap module pulls in metadata from your networking. Uh, so you can pull in either attached to a device or pull in a PCAP file and pull metadata. Uh, it can be very useful for features or for systems where you don't get good uh, debug logging. Uh, if you don't have access to de debug logging for DNS, for instance, you could still use this and capture like port 53 traffic. All right. Next thing is uh, new protocols. Um, so batch compress is a big deal for Enterprise Edition. Uh, batch compress is a NX log to NX log solution. Uh, it's proprietary, so it's unfortunately doesn't work with other products, uh, but it's really good at what it does. Uh, it will take all fields that are available. It will be able to encrypt the data. You can compress the data and send in batches. Um, this also adds batch level acknowledgments. So if a batch isn't sent, it will resend the, the batch. Uh, uses serialized binary data. And the compression is super good for thin links. And we'll, we'll touch on the, the actual compression here in a little bit as well. Uh, also support web HDFS. Uh, HTTP is an input, uh, named pipes, UDP spoofing, uh, and zero MQ. Uh, TLS is also supported. Obviously, we like security. Uh, a couple of the enhancements with TLS in EE versus uh, CE is we have new support for 1.3. Uh, we can use stream compression, so SSL-based compression. Uh, EE allows you to choose your protocols and which cipher suites you want to use. Uh, by default, it'll try uh, 1.2 and 1.3 TLS, but you can limit that to whatever you need. And then EE also supports pulling 
uh, CA thumbprints from the Windows search store. Uh, as far as formats go, uh, again, this is a non-exhaustive list, but some of the uh, more fun stuff is the AIX audits, um, Apple system logs, including the unified logging system, the new uh, ULS, uh, Sun BSM, uh, ArcSight CEF, Leaf formats, NetFlow, Radius NPS, uh, SNMP trap messages, uh, W3C extended log format, which is a huge time saver if you're using any kind of W3C events, uh, Grok pattern support, and then the uh, XML based pattern support from our uh, PM pattern module. All right, so got a couple uh, format improvements as well. Obviously, JSON and XML are supported on CE. Uh, EE takes it a couple steps farther. So some of the important improvements are flatten and un unflatten. Uh, what this will do is take nested JSON and turn it into addressable uh, fields. So for instance, if you have a nested uh, field with the flatten, it will write it out as the primary dot secondary field. Um, that's to say any kind of nested would be a dot extension. Uh, Unflatten will do kind of the opposite. So you can create fields that are primary dot secondary, and then it will create a nested structure based off of those fields. Um, if you have to do the same thing in C, it's a kind of a convoluted process of creating a JSON and then deleting some fields and creating another J JSON. So it's quite a bit more involved. Uh, detect nested JSON. Obviously, since we're dealing with nested JSON, this is a uh, a good to have, right? Uh, we want to see if the fields are nested. Uh, the ability to include hidden fields. Uh, by default, period and underscore starting fields are ignored. Uh, this flips that and allows those to be created inside of a JSON event. Uh, we have the access to a pretty print uh, mechanism. So if you need to spit out JSON in a pretty print format so it's easy to read, we can handle that. And then some date improvements. Uh, so in CE, JSON has to use the date format that's used globally. Uh, here, we can have JSON using its own date format. Uh, we can also use the parse date function to pull out the event, uh, event date and transform it however we need. Uh, some XML improvements. Uh, the ability to change the root tag. Uh, by default, root tags for XML is just going to be called event. And this is just really to match with the Windows style structure, if you're familiar with it. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, though. We can also ignore the root tag. So instead of having the event, we can pull that off. And instead of referencing event.field, we can just say the starting field. Uh, something more fun and infinitely more usable is the parse attributes. Uh, so I put an example here. Uh, so we've got the field, we've got the message field, we've got time and type attributes. Uh, if we're parsing the attributes, we can pull this data out as, uh, as seen here. Message.time will pull us the time field, message.type. And then message will give us the actual content of the message. Uh, another fun feature we have is the parse windows event log XML. It's kind of a mouthful, but uh, it does exactly what it says. If you get XML data from event log, so say you've, you've chosen to pull in the event log XML data, this will parse it out uh, as it should be. So it'll get the event data, it'll get all your, your proper event data fields. Uh, and then you can choose to prefix the windows event however you want as well. Again, if you don't want to go with the standard naming, you can you can name it something separate. Uh, this can be useful for pulling in maybe two different uh, event log channels, and you don't want to confuse them. All right, so a couple new tools in Enterprise. Uh, we've got the XM file list. Uh, this can be used with the file uh, IM file module, uh, and basically you can set up a wildcard in IM file to pull in your directory and then use the file list to give a, basically a whitelist or a blacklist of, of what files you want to pull that match that, that uh, wildcard. Uh, XM rewrite is something I use a lot more often now than I used to. Uh, it handles fields, kind of like how we use files in the file list. And that's to say that there is a whitelist and a blacklist of fields. Uh, so for instance, if you use the keep directive, write out a list of fields, that's the only ones you're going to end up with after you process it. Um, and kind of the more interesting thing here is there's a process function you can use. So you basically call process, and it will run all of your commands in the rewrite module. Uh, I use this 
more specifically to handle execs now. Uh, so instead of having to take exec code and write it multiple places, I'll store my exec inside of a rewrite and then process it wherever I need to. And this can be good for transforming events as well, uh, especially if there's custom formats that don't match any of the existing, so CEF or syslog. Uh, next one up is XM Crypto. Uh, this was added in EE5. Uh, crypto is really just a, uh, an encryption for files. Uh, so basically, when you write out using OM file to the file system, we can encrypt it now. Uh, it uses AES 256 CVC encryption. Um, it's, uh, since it uses the OpenSSL protocol, you can use OpenSSL uh, to decrypt it as well. Uh, next one is Zlib. It does similar, but this is for compression for file streams. So now you can compress a file as you're writing it out. Uh, this uses the Zlib, uh, Zlib library, which allows you to use tools like gzip uh, to extract the files. Obviously, we can read them back in as well, but in case you need an external. Uh, XM Resolver is another tool that's only in the EE product. Uh, this will, uh, it's got several little sub tools built into it. Uh, one of them can be DNS resolution. Uh, it does a cache local. So basically it'll look it up once, it'll keep the cache for whatever your, your time to live is, and then redo the, the search, redo the query. Uh, this is great for cases where you need to uh, match host names, for instance. Uh, it can also do uh, UIDs, uh, GUIDs, Linux and Windows. So uh, quite a powerful tool. Uh, and obviously not another exhaustive list, but some of the bigger ones, uh, additional input and output modules. Uh, Kafka in and out, great for high-end, high EPS uh, instances. Redis, same thing. Uh, IMETW, this one will pull event tracing straight from Windows without having to use an intermediary file. Uh, a lot of our competitors will have to have a tool that pulls out data, spits out a file, and then they'll read the file. Uh, we can communicate straight to ETW this way. Uh, WS Eventing, this is the WEF and WIC um, solution. It can run on Windows or Linux, so you could connect using Kerberos or HTTPS and pull in events. Uh, ODBC is another addition for EE. Uh, if you've got a ODBC connection on your, your system, we can obviously pull that in uh, or can send out to ODBC. Uh, I am system D. This is a journal replacement, uh, or not replacement, but a, a journal reader. Uh, so if you've got a system D based system and you're reading journal events from it, this is your solution. Uh, Windows performance counts. Uh, this can pull in any of the WinPerf counts uh, on your system. So basically just look it up, find the name, stick it in the, the module, you'll grab it. Uh, some customers use this to pull in uh, disk IO, to pull in memory, uh, memory usage, CPU usage, those kind of things, just to keep up with their servers. Uh, we've got OM Rygen. This is uh, one of our new products is Rygen. It's a schema-less database. Um, we can point to it uh, later, but uh, for right now, it's just uh, good to know that we can send data to it. Um, it can accept JSON strings and create fields itself. Uh, I've got checkpoint inputs, Azure inputs, uh, IM HTTP. Uh, remember, the OM HTTP is in CE, but in EE, this is uh, allows IM as well. Uh, Unix and Linux accounting, Unix and Linux auditing, and so much more. Uh, if we went over all of these modules, it would take several pages. So in addition to new modules, uh, we've got some additional benefits or enhancements to the existing modules. Uh, IMMS Vista log, like we mentioned, is probably the most used log or used module. And some of the new features in EE are capturing the event XML. This is that XML tab, if you were to go to look at an event. Uh, so you can pull in that event XML, use the XML enhancements parsing to pull out that data and create fields from it. Uh, also allows loading files. So EVT, EVTX, and ETL files. Uh, great for any kind of forensics kind of usage. So reading the file, pulling data. Uh, if you've got some use case where you're running EVTX as a live log, we can handle that as well. 
Uh, also allows remote polling of events. So we can use this module to connect to a system remotely, uh, set up the username, password, uh, host name, that kind of thing, uh, and pull the event log directly. Uh, we can resolve GUIDs and SIDs within this module. Uh, and this can also come into a secondary field. So instead of pulling in the account name, you could pull in account name as the SID and also create a new field if you wanted. Uh, so it'd be good to have both of your resolved and unresolved uh, content. Uh, one of the kind of limitations of CE is if there is a channel that's missing that you're trying to, to uh, pull from, it'll error out. Uh, so tolerate query errors uh, will basically be able to pull the channels that are not erroring out. Uh, we can also bypass the channel limit, which I think is 256. Um, so we've got some methods in place where EE will pull past the channel limit. Uh, OMHDP has a couple additions, uh, adding and modifying headers as they're sent. Uh, so we've got a directive for that and the procedure here. Uh, we've got batch mode support. Um, the way it works in CE is each individual event is processed as an individual post. So there's quite a bit of overhead there. Uh, with batch mode, we support multi-part and multi-line. Uh, makes HTTP quite a bit more efficient. And we can also send content type with OMHTTP now. Uh, IAM file has a couple neat things. Uh, there's an exclude files directive, which works kind of like the file list, but it's more simplistic. And then one of the, uh, I guess, more fun things with IAM file is we can use the on end of file directive to either renew, uh, remove the file, rename the file, process it, uh, maybe use it in coordination with the exec module to zip up the file. Uh, so a lot of options there. Another feature in EE is network failover. Uh, this works kind of like an active passive setup. Uh, you'll be listing either host or URL directives uh, one after another in a list format. Top is the first tried and then it tries down the list as it fails. Uh, so batch compress, elastic, HTTP, Rigen, SSL, TCP, UDP, and UDP spoof all support this. So most of the main networking modules. Uh, programming language support. So if all of our other modules don't work for you, you can always build something yourself. Uh, if you've got a interesting or quirky need that uh, isn't handled by most of the default uh, modules. You could use Go, Java, Perl, Python, or Ruby to create either an input, output, or extension module. So if you need to process something that we don't handle, uh, you could pull in maybe a Python library and handle it. Um, one of the, I guess, kind of fun things we did here in the last couple of weeks was uh, input EVTX files on a Linux box. Um, customer had a use case of dumping the EVTX files and needed to process them, uh, but he wanted to process them on Linux. So we used IAM uh, Python, run a uh, public library, and pulled in the EVTX uh, events. Uh, it's important to note that XM Perl is still included in CE, uh, but the other modules are not. All right, so a couple of other advantages here of uh, NX Log EE is meeting compliance targets. So depending on what your compliance target is, uh, obviously we can handle some data masking with those language modules. Uh, we've got some functions built in for uh, converting a field to, or a string or a field to uh, SHA-256. Uh, we can base 64 encode them. We can MD5 sum them. Uh, you know, so there's there's options there. We can also use the NX log language to remove. So if you had a uh, pay systems and you wanted to remove credit card numbers, uh, that's available. Uh, there's also data at rest protection with that XMZlib, uh, which is a common newer requirement. Uh, we've got HMAC for message integrity checking, making sure that nothing's been changed between two NX log systems. Uh, something that's also a little bit harder to visualize is the uh, updates. So we mentioned that CE is updated maybe once a year. Uh, EE is updated every couple months uh, with features and then any of the hot fixes are available immediately. Uh, obviously, both products, any kind of security fixes, we push out immediately as well. Uh, EE also has professional support, whereas CE does not. Uh, NXLog CE 
is built off of an older code, uh, code base. So an older version of EE is the, the basis for CE. Uh, we don't ever limit the CE product, but just because it's older and we've had a lot more tweaks on the EE product, EE ends up being more performant as well. Uh, EE is also available compiled for more platforms. Uh, CE can be challenging to build on older systems or even really new systems, really. Uh, so we handle the uh, compilation there. Uh, the environment variables, we can access environment variables on NXLog EE. Uh, can be useful for if you're setting up environment variables that you want to attach to the events. We've had customers uh, put in cust uh, custom information for hosts and then pull them through environment variable. Uh, include standard out is another fun uh, directive. Uh, basically, this runs a script, and the output of the script is stuck in the configuration file. So you could run like a PowerShell script to make custom uh, inputs or custom outputs, uh, bash script, uh, script, whatever your options are. Uh, got access to add-ons with the enterprise product. So some of the bigger ones are the exchange audit logs. Uh, this is mailbox auditing, uh, Azure and 0365 event logs, Okta, Amazon S3, input and output, uh, Salesforce, and then there's more. All right, so we'll touch just a little bit on some use cases. Uh, we get asked a lot about compression and the batch compress compression is a really hot topic, especially here lately. Uh, so this is just a graph showing you source data, how big that event is with TCP, because obviously TCP adds a little bit of overhead. Uh, what it's like to send as a binary format instead of the, the standard uh, text-based format. Uh, so sending all the fields, obviously that's that's huge. Uh, but if we use batch compress instead on the raw event, we can see that it's about 19% of the original source data. And then if we choose all fields, it's about 35% of the source data, which is just huge wins there, uh, especially if you're in a situation where you're paying for your bandwidth to your SIM or you're just wanting to be more efficient on the network, then uh, this is good for you. Uh, we went over the benefits already, uh, but basically keep in mind that it compresses, it can be encrypted, uh, everything's sent in batches, and then it can retain all fields and has batch level, uh, sorry, batch level acknowledgements. All right, so we talked about W3C just a little bit. Uh, here's kind of a real world example of pulling in uh, IIS logs. Uh, so the top box is your IIS, uh, shows example of the headers, which are the fields starting with the pound signs. Um, one of the important ones to keep up with is that fields. Uh, so fields is, uh, in IIS, if you're not familiar with it, you can go into the configuration and tell it what kind of logging you want. So W3C is what is the default there. And then you have a fields button where you can choose which fields you want to show in your output. Uh, so this is cool. You get to customize your own logging. Uh, the limitation that we come up with here is the CE way of handling this uses uh, CSV, so comma separated values. It shows which fields are there. Uh, you've got to match up your fields list to the fields list in the input. Uh, otherwise, you'll get to a point where you don't have uh, a field and it'll error out. Uh, so if something changes in the future, uh, so you decide you want to add another field to your logging, then you've got to go into your source uh, configuration inside of CE add a field, add a field type if you want to specify types, and then restart it. Whereas on the right-hand side, this is the enterprise way of doing the same thing. Uh, this uses the W3C parser, which goes ahead and takes those fields in uh, automatically, does its magic in the background. And if there's an update, it just sends you the new updates. There's no reconfiguration. All right, so how to migrate from NXLog CE to EE. Uh, this is really straightforward, so this is going to be quick. Um, basically, configuration-wise, EE will run CE configs. Uh, there's probably one or two small use cases where it's it's not, but it'll tell you exactly what's going on. Um, the important thing to remember is EE does have additional directives, and some of those additional directives cause EE to work a little bit differently. So if you want to take advantage of some of the newer features, for instance, you'll want to add EE directives. But for the most part, you can just load up CE config into EE. Um, EE does have some changes with some configuration. Uh, for instance, the host and listen address uh, directives. 
uh, they used to be separated in uh, up through version four of EE, and they're separated in CE. So you'd have a host and a port. Uh, starting with version five to accommodate the failover directives, uh, we have host and port as one. So you'll end up listing host, you'll have your address colon port. Uh, another important thing to remember is that the location changes for the install. Uh, on Linux-based systems, CE will use like etc nxlog.conf as the configuration. Uh, it'll write logs to var logs. Uh, but in the EE product, everything's moved over to opt, uh, opt NX log, and then logs and configuration, all that's below the opt NX log structure. Uh, for Windows, similar, uh, CE comes in as 32-bit, uh, installs on the x86 uh, directory structure, 64-bit uh, Windows now installs into program files. Uh, the basic process for upgrading from CE to EE is uh, back up your configurations, uh, obviously, this is safety. You should do it in just about any case, just to make sure you, you don't lose anything. Uh, CE will be uninstalled. You'll install the EE uh, and make sure you have your configs copied over. Uh, we can help with this a little bit. Uh, we have a contrib repository uh, product. Uh, it's the MSI cert conf. Uh, and basically what it does is it'll take your configuration, uh, any certificates that you want to pass to it, uh, and it'll build a MSI packager for you. So if you're using SCCM, you could send out the installer package and then install or send out the configuration package. It'll drop off the files, restart the service, and you'll be good. Uh, this is especially useful if you're loading your agents into the manager product. So you could load them all up and, and uh, connect to manager all in one shot. Got a couple additional resources here. Uh, so we've got the contrib repository, like what we talked about. Uh, it's got some FIM examples. Uh, it's got some XM admin uh, scripts. So I think there's a Python, a Perl, and I think there's even some bash scripts in there for the JSON and SOAP methods. Uh, there's a section for WEF cert tools. Uh, creating certificates for WEF is notoriously annoying. Uh, there's that MSI packager that we talked about. There's an XSD file for the pattern database. There's the S3 input and output scripts. Uh, there's some other, more stuff in there, but that's the, the big ticket items. Uh, obviously, the user guide is amazing. Um, it's, uh, I guess, like it's over a thousand pages now. Uh, it's got tons of information, lots of copy and pasteable configs. Uh, there's a good integration section in there. So chances are, if you're wanting to integrate with something, the integration section will have what you need in a pretty easy to understand and copy and pasteable format. Uh, we've got the community forums for if you need support off of the uh, free products or if you don't have support agreement. Uh, here's the sales and pre-sales email addresses if you need to talk to any of the sales or pre-sales teams. Uh, and then we've got a CE versus EE handout uh, that we'll be emailing to you guys after. Uh, so I think it's the end of this week is when they're sending it out. And that's it. Do we have any questions for uh, today's session?